So, uh, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to our program on Reading Refugees, Reading Migration. This is a teacher's online course. It has been organized by Calcutta Research Group in collaboration with Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna. And uh, this is a part of our forced migration studies program that has been designed in collaboration with Rosa Luxemburg Stifton and Institute of Vienna, uh, Human Sciences, Vienna. So um, this is uh, today's uh, theme for the lecture is research methods in migration. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Aisha Chalar, who will be delivering a lecture on city as a method. Uh, Professor Chalar has a very illustrative background and it's really very difficult to sum up her works in such a short time, but we'll have a small introduction about her. Uh, she has been the professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology, Vienna University, and a permanent fellow at IWM. She received her PhD at McGill University, Department of Anthropology and Habilitation in Sociology and Social Anthropology at Free University Berlin. Before joining University of Vienna, she was a professor and the chair of the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology at Central European University Budapest and was a Minerva Fellow at Max Planck Institute for the study of religious and ethnic diversity, Gottingen. She has held visiting professorships in several universities, including Stockholm, IHS Vienna, Central European University Budapest, and very many other places. Uh, so I now uh, will hand over the floor to Professor Chalar. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Maybe one could, I mean, everyone could just turn on the videos for once, at least I see uh, once everyone, <laughs> and uh, then you could turn it off because of the, um, because of the connections. I found it always very difficult to um, online talks when the cameras are off, and I do understand why they have to be off, and talking as and having the feeling that um, no contact in a way uh, with the pre uh, with the people I'm trying to talk to. <clears throat> so that is very good. So at least I could see uh, some of you and some of the uh faces i think some of the faces that uh i know first of all let me uh, start by thanking to the crg and uh it has been i have been collaborating with the crg uh for a while and to, to uh, 2018 i was at the winter school i always say that that was very much an eye-opening experience for me i was very much um, impressed uh, by the discussions and why uh, the relevance of collaboration, thinking to uh, looking at Europe, but vice versa to different places through the kind of the historical and academic and scholarly experiences and uh, traditions. So um, thank, uh, I'm very happy to be part of this teacher's uh, workshop. And I think this is a valuable, um, uh, valuable uh, initiative. So um, I'm, work I'm very much looking forward to your uh, comments and then uh, the discussion afterwards. Uh, Ritu Parna had kindly introduced that it is within the kind of the research methods, but it was, uh, as she had also said, that uh, city uh, as a uh, method. My talk will be based on that kind of the interface between the cities and the migrants and the refugees. So what I refer by city as method is an argument that city serves as a crucial entry point to understand the multiscalar dynamics of migration and migrants and placement and vice versa, meaning that migrants are crucial in understanding the processes of city making too. So this is an argument about the 
intrinsic entanglement of migration and urban studies. I will start by making a claim that, which I have spoken once before, that urban question has always been a question of uh, migration. What I mean by this is that we cannot think of cities being constituted without various forms of migration and migrant labor. In fact, if we were to simply follow, which I keep always saying that Bertolt Brecht in his famous poem, Questions from a Worker Who Reads, which starts with the question of who built tapes of the seven gates and continues to ask about those who erected the triumphal arches of great Rome and about those who cooked the feast for the victors. And following Brecht, and if we ask ourselves, who builds the cities? Who enables the running of the services? Who maintains and cleans the offices, hospitals? Who works in the construction and especially in the infrastructure projects that are crucial for the urban growth? We will quickly find the displaced and dispossessed migrant labor at the heart of cities. It is almost impossible to think of cities without migration and migrant labor. Thus studying the making and remaking of cities gives us a very good entry point to study migrants and migration. Today, the urban question is, which I have said that it was always a migration question, it's even more of a migration question and vice versa. This is so not only because increasingly high percentage of world population live in cities. Yes, they do live in cities and they will increasingly live in cities, but not only, but because cities are upfront in the generation of wealth within the current forms of capitalist ordering of economy. So cities are strategic sites for regimes of uh, accumulation. So um, why do the cities have such a prominent position now? For, for this, we have to start from the particular dynamics of cities in pursuit of generation of wealth and migrants place in these dynamics. First of all, many cities utilize very proactive, which is referred as entrepreneurial strategies to increase their competitive advantage to accrue capital and power. They utilize such strategies in pursuit of greater local, national, regional, and global connectedness, so as to be able to achieve growth and generate wealth and power. And migrants are central to these dynamics. We cannot think of those dynamics without the migrants and especially migrant labor. Because migrant labor is crucial to the processes of reordering the urban spaces and the related regimes of value, they are essential for the restructuring of capital and politics in the city. So studying these urban dynamics studies necessitates studying the migrants in these processes. Both processes, the way I see, are mutually constitutive. So it is very difficult to talk about one without the other, but my entry point, starting point is from the city. What kind of sites we are talking when we are talking about cities today? Cities are uh, first of all sites, as has been uh, underlined several times in literature, of hyper, hyper commodified land, sites of extraction, especially based on rent and logistical nodes, but they are also crucial sites for new forms of servicing, new place-based services that are crucial 
for the logistical, economic, and financial sectors. We can just, uh, even with the financial sectors, we could, uh, we could immediately think, we don't have to think about the skilled migrant labor, uh, that kind. We can immediately think about the clear cleaners and maintenance workers of the finance offices, headquarters, about which uh, Saskia Sassen had spoken about uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s in the global cities. Cities' importance as centers of logistics and servicing, as well as of informal economies, became more obvious with COVID-19. Uh, we have seen that how important that those services, service economies, informal labor were so crucial for the uh, urban, uh, ur not only the urban economies, but also uh, livelihood. With the lockdown, we had seen that how they had to be retransformed and reorganized. Within the neoliberal ordering, ordering, cities require flexible, easily disposable, increasingly informal labor in varying forms of legal, economic, social, and political dispossession. A labor that is fractured in various ways in terms of their social, economic, and legal standing and rights is at the heart of these cities growth based economies so that those economies can only work in terms of those variegated forms of labor in terms of their legal economic and political standing and rights this is the migrant labor which the bordering regimes continue to multiply this process in multiple ways. Here, I'm not talking about in terms of just kind of international borders. It is about the bordering regimes, which create difference, which create the hierarchies, and they uh, dispossess the, the labor, the produce dispossess labor in multiple ways. So frontier policies, which fracture and hierarchize labor are crucial for urban economies and also for governance. City as method in the title is an allegation to Sandra Mazado's work, border as method. What I refer here is how cities could be a fruitful methodological entry point from which a whole series of strategic concepts of migration as well as their relations can be recast. What are these? That is, there are several kinds of concepts, but in my work, which I use it, and then which I think is very relevant to the, to the kind of cities that we're talking about, and for migrant labor, is displacement and dispossession. Focusing on the interface between migrants and city making enables us to explore and understand the crucial role that particular way of looking at cities play in understanding migrants and migrant dynamics in times of global capitalism. It is a kind of an, it is an epistemological point. In a nutshell, city provides us a viewpoint to describe and understand the multiple and mutually constitutive relations between migrants and cities city make. Here, it is important to note that urban processes are essential not only for the production and the circulation of labor in particular forms, but also to keep labor disposable, dispossessed, dispersed, and a surplus that is inherent to capitalism and even more so for neoliberal cities. In that sense, cities become the frontiers of migration in the real sense of the term. This is why city is a suitable methodological entry point for studying the location of migrants and migration in the accumulation processes without which we cannot think of 
cities. Here it is important to note that what I'm talking about is not only the multiplication of labor through frontier policies, but this differentially situated and cheapened migrant labor is juxtaposed on differently valued spaces of neoliberal cities. City spaces are fractured. We know that by a plethora of zoning and varying social, economic, and legal regulations in terms of rights, working conditions, and tax regulations. Thus, we have the juxtaposition of a double fracturing the processes that we are talking about. What, uh, that is to say the juxtaposition of a fractured, multiplied labor hierarchized labor to differentiated city spaces and territory. We could understand the place of migrants in relation to the dynamics and governance of these spaces and vice versa. So, and we could understand those spaces also in relation to the uh, migrants. That is why the urban and migration questions are mutually constituted and urban question is also it's a question of migrant governance in the context of neoliberal urban politics. It is also when we are talking about migrant governance, of course, we are talking about the governance of labor, but not only. Now I would like to uh, complicate this relationship between migrant labor and city making. Though the figure of migrant is crucial to the city making processes as labor, as I have started talking about, I do not think that their location in these processes could be reduced to labor. Yes, migrants are a substantial part of the uh, labor force, dispossessed labor, urban uh, poor, but not only. Reducing migrants to these categories, these groups, these uh, qualities would be to reduce, I think, the multiple location of migrants in making and remaking of cities. This becomes clearer in the current form of urban dynamics in today's capitalism. That is why I think this is important to focus on city as method in today's world. As I mentioned, migrants are definitely part of the way capital is accrued and labor is governed in urban redevelopment. But they are also crucial to the various and multiscalar political, economic, cultural, and religious networks that make and remake the city's power. Migrants are part of these networks, which position the cities in relation to global, regional, and national power hierarchies. I think it is important to recognize that migrants become part of the social, economic, political, and cultural landscape of the cities in multiple ways as they take up multiple social positions. What are these positions that they take up? They take up positions as residents, as taxpayers, students, debtors, moneylenders, tenants, landlords, household members, neighbors, officials, and last but not the least, as activists and political actors. It is important to focus on migrants' place in various urban domains as actors that contribute to the positioning, repositioning of the cities within a particular power geometry. It might be also useful to remember that migrants are often actors of urban politics with other residents in raising political claims for social and historical justice. They become part of the participatory claims of the excluded and very often the dispossessed. I will come back to this point later, but this is a very important part of approaching trying to understand the location of migrants in the in cities. In a nutshell, these are the contours of why looking at the dynamics of urban transformation are crucial to understand the varying forms and location of 
migrants and migration. It is important to note that the dynamics and paradoxes, which I underline, of neoliberal urban development shape the value regimes in the cities. Neoliberal urban development, um, very briefly, entails processes of accumulation, dispossession, and revaluation of city spaces, population segments, and particular periods of the cities as heritage, particular heritage, and related practices. The regeneration processes in each city, for example, the ones which uh, we have studied in our book, Migrants and City Making, were intertwined with incentives to revalue property, sites, local histories, and segments of the population. And this is not a linear, it is not a kind of a one, um, uh, one line process. In each city, make migrants, but also what I'm talking about is that also some mi minorities, because migrants and then minorities are also, uh, uh, there is kind of family resemblances in terms of the way that they are placed in the uh, urban, in, in cities. But of course, as I said, that with the migrants that I start from that, the labor point. They acquire an increased value within the revaluation processes connected to accumulation of power and wealth in relation to those uh, cities' um, networks of institutions of power and investment. In our research, we found that, for example, migrants were integral to the value creation processes fueled by the real estate and international subprime mortgage industry. They served as real estate and mortgage brokers and city, as city residents who redeveloped property, who stabilized neighborhoods, who took out subprime mortgages, and of course, suffered foreclosures with the collapse of the property market. We, especially after the 2008 crisis, we saw this process very clearly. So we saw in our research in various cities that migrants and refugees, they revalued the aging housing stock or stored value in decaying houses. And when I'm saying that for the migrants, but it also includes the refugees, apartments and became part of the financialization of housing and property markets, as much as they contributed to the construction sector and infrastructure projects, logistic networks and service sectors. And we have seen now actually with the um, new um, arrival of the, the refugees in several places, but where I am located now, for example, in Istanbul, they are the uh, the refugees are actually uh, storing value in decaying houses. On the other hand, inflating of course the uh, of, of course the rent. But we have seen similar processes at the heart of Europe in Germany, but also in uh, U.S. So migrants and refugees not only become cheapened dispossessed labor, but they also become means to access varying scales of funding in several places. And it is very important because with the kind of the cities that we are talking about, you have to access uh, several different forms and scales of funding for the urban growth. In several places, migrants and refugees became the ground through which property developers were able to reach out to funding uh, and, and also powerful institutions uh, like federal funding or supranational institutions like EU and the ones in uh, Europe. So migrants or for that matter minorities, despite their racialization could acquire value as part of the disadvantaged or as part of the diverse group in city leaders' attempts to access the funding. In this way, of course, depending on the conjunctural forces, they facilitate cities' reach to 
power laden networks of institutions and of course investments and capital floor. So this is one of the examples of migrants becoming city makers beyond migrant labor, although the labor aspect is central. Consequently, migrants become part of cultural industries in connection to capital and urban restructuring geared to establish and um, uh, strengthen the competitive work of the uh, worth of the city in order to attract capital and investment and then again reach out funds and institutions in that regard too. As soon as cultural industries become part of the re and devaluation processes in and through urban regeneration, they opened possibilities and spaces for migrants and refugees to be located within the institutions and networks of cultural production, like in music, literature, film, theater production, and circulation. For example, in one of the cities I have worked, we have seen very clearly that with the restructure, neoliberal restructuring of the city, uh, has uh, that uh, restructuring has deepened heavily on within those projects, uh, it's dependent on those projects within which migrants and in, the case, in, in this case, minorities presence played an important role in reaching institutions like UNESCO or EU or UNDP. The, these in turn were important to perform the stability, safety and openness of the city to attract and secure investment and capital flow to the city. For example, in that city, particular kind of artistic production and heritage connected to migrants, but also minorities became prominent within the image of the city. In underlying, but please do not uh, misunderstand me. In underlying this aspect, my aim is not to degrade or belittle these productions and practices, but to argue for the need to approach these migrant-centered, minority-centered related cultural productions in relation to the broader dynamics of uh, these cities. In this way, we could complicate the entanglement of the urban question with the question of migration beyond simply labor. So, uh, and I also I would like to underline that these productions might acquire kind of a, uh, might uh, acquire value and uh, get some support uh, for very different reasons, but it doesn't remain there. And they open spaces for migrants and minorities and the refugees to uh to express or to uh to find and to become a voice in the politics in the cultural life of those places but so i'm not saying that this is not happening however i think it is uh this might be very much at, at least uh, in these places where i have looked at it if you ask why this is happening here and now then you see this kind of processes However, I think it is important to keep in mind that these processes often go hand in hand with the use of fully dispossessed migrant labor, be cross-border or from the rural population. So we could extend these observations and examples to some general theoretical points, I think. In order to understand the value regimes in the neoliberal order of the cities, when I'm referring to that, which group, which sites, which spaces, which activities will be, uh, will acquire a value or devalued, it might be useful to approach these dynamics from the perspective of the colonial and racial logic of capitalism, namely from the perspective of coloniality of power. Coloniality of power 
refers to the legitimizing and naturalizing narratives of racialized, culturalized, and gender differences, which are fundamental for the appropriation and the dispossessive processes underlying capital accumulation. So such a perspective, so again, you see that these differences, these kind of rationalized, culturalized gender differences and the narratives about them and naturalizing narratives are related for the capital accumulation. Such a, such a, if we understand that kind of the relationship, uh, if we assume this perspective urges us to analyze both processes in relationship to each other. Most importantly, the centrality of the legitimizing narratives of difference is true not only for the dehumanization and demonization narratives of appropriation, but also for the valorization of particular spaces, practices, and pasts, heritage, which also are entangled with capital accumulation. So this is a call actually to bring those different uh, processes of uh, value creation, valorization and devaluation under the uh, common analytical lens of coloniality of power. Both forms of revaluation processes, especially in relation to migrants and refugees take place simultaneously as part of the these cities' strategies and dynamics of accumulating capital and investment and power. It's in, it is within these broader dynamics of capitalism and, uh, and urban dynamics, migrants, ac refugees acquire value and presence within the cultural and artistic networks and city imaginaries. And devaluation and revaluation of migrants and it is important, I think, to underline these both revalorization and devalorization uh, of migrants, refugees could go simultaneously. Hierarchization of together with the hierarchization of migrants and minorities and refugees. So they could be uh, simultaneously in place in contradictory ways in the value regime of cities. So approaching dynamics of cultural production, addressing, involving, uh, encompassing migrants, refugee minorities uh, in this way, where they are not only reduced to labor, though labor is their essential connection or raison d'etre of that urban economy, is in a way to embark on the analysis of the political economy of cities, cultural reach, cultural industries and of the place of migrants in these dynamics. So it is expanding the understanding of the political, of eco political economy of cities within a, sim uh, within a common analytical lens. So the location of migrants and refugees often ambiguous and selective and sometimes contradictory in these processes become legible once we read them in relation to those dynamics of cultural institutions within the urban reordering dynamics. So again, this is not saying anything against their content and quality of those cultural productions, but it is about situating them and their actors within value regime dynamics of neoliberal cities. We could understand these dynamics once we make and those kind of the contradictory locations and simultaneously contradictory locations once we make the city as the entry point of our analysis. Now I would like to come to the ways in which migrants become, as I said, important political actors in urban politics. For this, I think one needs to focus on the paradoxes of neoliberal austerity urbanism and their impact on urban contentious politics. The, what we know about the neoliberal uh, austerity urbanism, first the massive and various rollbacks of welfare, welfare states, which uh, inflicted a deep crisis on cities. And this 
austerity urbanism is characterized by sharp reduction in central government spending on local government, and it provokes growing conflict of over payment for resources such as water, electricity, and basic services. That is why, in a way, actually, this kind of the sharp reduction in central government spending and it forces the cities to uh, try to uh, generate their wealth through their very different kinds of networks. It primarily, this kind of urbanism yields in private wealth rather than public services for the residents, especially through the public-private partnerships and debt economy. These transformations impact governance structures, public services, the funds and opportunities available to all urban inhabitants, migrant, not those who are defined as non-migrant, quote unquote, native. This, of course, contributes to making cities extremely contested and conflicted spaces where various groups and actors fight for resources, rights, presence, and justice, and confronted with the increasing impoverishment, disparities, and debt economies. So these are the, uh, we are confronted with increasing impoverishment, and then the uh, different groups are really have to fight for more for resources and uh, rights. In the context of finance-driven accumulation, where the main mechanisms of rent extraction are centered on debt-funded privatization, urban growth becomes increasingly rent-centered. In the context of accumulation by dispossession, not by expanded reproduction. The, the Harvey showed us very well the growth of profits and capital followed the closure of access to assets, access to commons, so massive devaluation and a reduction of social rights, and of course, the commons. Consequently, cities which have been taking a more corporate character have increasingly become a battlefield marked by the struggle of groups for resources, space, rights claims, and for justice. So cities are not only the centers of wealth accumulation, but also the important sites where new forms of social relation and politics are made and remade. One of the readings that I gave also from Holston actually uh, shows this quite well. So they become frontiers in economy and contentious politics in several sense. So cities, we see them as the frontiers in economy, frontiers of migration and contentious politics. Here, I would like to open a caveat again. I'm not saying that cities became contentious sites only now. Um, on the contrary, the cities have, they have never been harmonious uh, sites, and, uh, but an extremely contentious place my, by, marked by groups of people fighting for resources, rights, claims, and justice, and space, of course. However, the neoliberal austerity urbanism makes the cities even more contentious places, and migrants become crucial actors in such claims, challenging the lines of participation, membership, the boundaries of the public and governance. And I would like to say a couple of things on contentious politics and the commoning processes they could unleash now. They could and they do unleash. We all know that city center protests so increasingly dominate politics. So the urban protests have a very prominent place now. One of the striking characteristics of these protests are their heterogeneous composition in the sense that defying social and class divides. The urban protesters range from precarious laborers, cultural and service workers, displaced members of the middle and working classes, unemployed and underpaid youth, indebted professionals and community activists, as well as migrants and refugees. 
we know that within the urban protests, especially in Europe, people do really look at those ones without looking at the uh, inclusion of the participation and the location of the migrants and refugees in those movements. In fact, I think the heterogeneity of the participants of these urban process be anti-austerity or for refugee and migrant claims, there are also mobilizations for migrants and for refugees. They could be seen as important ground for urban politics rather than a weakness some of the literature deals with as that uh, the lead deals with that. One of the important aspects of the contentious neighbor, nature of urban protests lies in their acts of collective production of the city as commons. Cities provide opportunities for people living together to act collectively in staking their claim to resources. As James Holston in the article that you read argues this acting together beyond the informal status of work, housing and legal standing lies at the core of becoming political and how practices of city making and citizenship become closely entangled. So city protests become key strategic sites for creating new forms of sociabilities and alliances. There is a process of collective learning and a ground, a basis for mutual trust in the activity of shared struggle. So the transformative nature of these mobilizations may well lie in the commoning processes pursued. And I think this is very valuable for urban politics. As has been repeated in re relation to different cases, div diverse groups of people, including those that have historically been in conflict with uh, one another, come together to claim occupy and appropriate various spaces in these protests. For sure, I, we are not, I'm not um, uh, making any illusions. This coexistence is not without frictions. Actually, it is a very frictional heterogeneity. The protesters, regardless of their status and background, exercise their right to urban resources and enact solidarities, alliances resulting from their shared discontent with the injustices infected upon them by the particular form of urban redevelopment. Drawing on Hannah Arendt, as also uh, Halston underlines, who sees the political realm of the police as emerging directly from acting together, from common words and deeds, we could argue that the, uh, uh, the insurgency and the political value of urban uprisings lie in this common act of city making. Residents become political subjects through these city making activities. Different groups come together in public space with an active sense of producing a common project while maintaining multiple separate alliances around specific goals, identities with respect to gender, class, ethnicity, legal status without erasing differences. So this kind of the commoning is not about erasing differences despite the differences. So it is such relations in which one acts as though all were equal despite differences are important. And these sociabilities emerge from shared experience and are built on the recognition of mutual affection and aspiration. So the acting together of the dispossessed and the displaced, the commoning of urban protesters could be seen as the basis for generating companionship among the differently positioned participants in urban protests beyond the canonized or historic divide. Unfortunately, there is a tendency to discuss such commoning processes almost exclusively in relation to anti-austerity mobilizations without taking note of the press refugees in them. Sometimes it is noted, but the importance of it for its kind of political consequences are not very often 
uh, elaborated. There is a silence about the commoning processes they entail. And studies on the entanglements of protest with diverse forms of urban struggles over labor, gentrification, access to public goods, among others, and support for social justice are rare. They often escape the attention of migrant scho migration scholars. But this does not mean that they are absent. I would like to draw attention to one striking example from a very short clip from a, a film uh, from Sao uh, documenting uh, an event and then a kind of a, a squat in uh, Brazil. And with the film is, some of you might know it, Cambridge called Cambridge uh, Squatter. So I should now the, uh, share the screen okay um uh, this is a squat um by people from uh very different uh walks of life who have whose livelihood has eroded they are mostly evicted they lost their jobs they lost their uh accommodation in Sao Paulo, and it was the documented. It's a kind of a partly a documentary, a kind of a, a film, but it's not completely pure documentary. Although all the people in the film are the uh, people who were living, uh, who the squatters. So there are no uh, um, the uh, professional actors. <laughs> vindo lá do, do fórum, é, a, a juíza, ela concedeu a reintegração de posse. O que quer dizer isso? Que vai ocorrer o despejo daqui a 15 dias. Calma, por favor. Vamos escutar, por favor, senhora, aqui na hora de lamentação. Vamos escutar. Temos que recorrer, porque esta propriedade aqui que vocês ocuparam é uma água lá em cima. Esse proprietário aqui... Você tomar o posse de verdade porque ela estava abandonada. Então vamos e fazer o judiciário reverter essa aparência. Se nós agora recuarmos, nós vamos aceitar a sentença do juiz. Então, pessoal, é hora da gente estar unido. É hora de nós estarmos juntos. É isso aí, cara. É isso aí. Vamos lá. refugiado da Colômbia, dos libaneses e palestinos, só que fica difícil. Agora, cara, será que, será que eu posso falar? Gente, gente, o que, o que, que você sabe? Se você não sabe, o Brasil, lá na ONU, faz bonito no, no político, na política internacional. Aí concede, concede, concede o refúgio para nós. Quando nós entramos aqui, aí cada um se vira. Nós somos problema do Brasil, sim, porque é o Brasil que concedeu para a gente o refúgio. Eu quero falar uma coisa. Eu sou refugiado palestino no Brasil. Vocês refugiados brasileiros no Brasil. Ah. 
has been squatted for uh, for a long time and as you see that the everything is there that there are professional kind of very activists I mean uh, almost uh, fully full-time activists there and uh, NGOs were involved but you see the kind of the frictions and in terms of that the where all those uh, 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 refugees and from very different uh, groups of people come uh, together. And I don't think that this Brazil example is not is unique. Migrants increasingly become part of those kind of contentious urban politics for social justice and are central to urban politics beyond migrant, minority, and ethnic politics. However, I think we need a particular perspective to capture these multiple locations of migrants in city making. We need to go beyond an analytical lens, which operates with an a priori categorical divide between migrants and quote unquote natives and, and refugees and beyond an ethnic lens of migration studies. So the challenge is, I think, to explore the multiple ways the migrants become the objects and subjects of city making, as well as the social justice movements. Approaching city as method could be a way to re respond to this challenge. This requires not only a particular epistemological position, but also a particular kind of data collection and a particular reading of the, the juxtaposition of different kinds of uh, data. For example, in our own research, we collected a wide range of data to understand and relate these revaluations re to the shared adoption of a specific mode of urban regeneration. As I said that we collected a wide range of data about the way city residents, both migrants and non-migrants, lived their lives and interacted with each other, each other, talked about their city, as well as, and this was very important, the structural data about the urban economic development and projects of these cities, including their funding uh, uh, structures. So most importantly, this data collection was guided by a theoretical awareness of the connection between the accumulation of capital and the futures and dynamics of neoliberal forms of urban structuring at a particular conjuncture and, and their interface with migrant lives. So the global features of this form of urban development unfolding differently in cities of different scale. I'm not saying that this is a template happening everywhere, but they have structural conditions and their paradoxes established the theoretical backdrop guiding our data collection and the specification of analysis. This form of research was built on an epistemological understanding of city as method. And I think this enabled us to uh, be able to see what we would not be able to see if we remain within the canonized migration scholarship. So I think I will stop here to uh, open it to hear your comments, your uh, feedback, and your discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chandler, for this engaging discussion. 
uh, we have quite a few questions uh, from the participants that we need to reflect on. So, uh, so we have first question from Sudip Basu. Yeah, uh, it, it was a uh, very illuminating uh, talk. Um, uh, just, I was just thinking about, I mean, I'm, there were a lot of points that were raised. One point which was striking was the fact that if we are taking the migrants and the forced migrants as a group to be considered, on the one hand, uh, they they add to the you know the anonymity of urban life, the canonical literature on urban life, which Zimel talked about. He was emphasizing that you know you have this anonymity, and migrants raise the anonymity. And at the same time, there is this strangeness quality to the migrant, which is a potential the reason for their exclusion and banishment. But on the other hand, what we see now, in, increasingly in the second half of the 20th century and with the coming of capital and the, the, the bogey of uh, securitization and other this thing, is the increasing visibility of the migrant and the migrant migrant as, as neighbor. So we are now increasingly thinking of them in ethnic terms and their visibility is also showing up because of their utter abjection and the way they, they live their life and the, the, the way the media has also highlighted their plight. So do you think that the cities in the near future would change the, our valuation of migrants? Valuation in the in the sense of the the, the 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 actual status of the migrant and the forced migrants as potential agents of change, and the agent as agents of change would be would it be through both resistance and cultural appropriation? So this is the the little futuristic projection of. Uh, we have other uh, questions from other participants. So. Um... Yeah, we can have all the questions together because some of them will be very common uh, to answer on. So uh, we have uh, next on in the shame in our list. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm slightly new to this area of research. Uh, I, I just wouldn't get that concept of uh, revaluing and devaluing and hierarchy hierarchization of uh, of of migrants in the urban space. Uh, it, it would just, it, it, for, for me to understand, it would probably help me, if you can give an instance, what what does it mean revaluing and devaluing? So uh, next we have Sheikh Rafikullah. Uh, hello ma'am, good evening. My question is like, uh, migrants come to cities for various reasons, uh, for better jobs, for education, for the modern lifestyle. But uh, like I have, uh, Listen to your lecture, and what I learned from your lecture that uh, they come to cities to play important political roles. Uh, I found this quite uh, ambitious. Like, ma'am, could you please share migrants' uh, percentage vis a vis cities' social population and uh, what, kind, what kind of political role uh, they play in cities vis a vis the local people? Thank you. Yes, uh, Kosturi Doctor, you can just uh, tell your query to ma'am. Hello, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for this wonderful uh, lecture. A lot of uh, a lot of aspects uh, interconnecting with each other, but I think and, and and there are a lot of things which I need to reflect back to also be able to uh, make sense of many debates. But uh, my question was in the rapidly changing. I mean, my question is particularly with concern to my country in India and the metropolitan cities here with the rapidly uh, changing city scapes, you know, in our uh, metropolitan cities and in the process of becoming economic and political subjects of neo neoliberal governance in such globalizing cities. These migrants, uh, and again, migrants, I'm not, I don't think so migrants, I'm sure you will uh, comment on it, they are not a homogeneous being per se, right? There are people who are coming with different, as uh, uh, one of my co-participants said, they're coming with different priorities. They're coming with different, uh, you know, uh, purposes and they sometimes go back and they come back. They, they are circulating uh, most of the time. 
so given that they are going through a process of becoming the subject of neoliberal governance they are acquiring certain new sensibilities which are also helping in the politicizing of them as citizens but they are also carrying with them certain native identities you know their native identities their native uh, uh, from where they are coming they are also intermingling in these cities in this sense so my question is how do we understand the political in the city you know this concept of political in the city is it just about the urban sites of protest and the everyday you know the the kind of uh, debate which they keep having with the state with the local governments uh with their uh, you know uh, employee employees or service providers uh how i mean so my question is how do we explore this concept of political in a more uh, you know broad way and how do we use city as a method to be able to you know kind of theorize that okay thank you very much first of all these are very uh good uh, questions and uh, first question is that looking at saying that the migrants are becoming uh visible in different forms that was the kind of the question i think and very often that kind of the ethnic uh ethnicity uh acquires a kind of a um overhand uh on uh, on that and i understood you correctly and uh, what would be the kind of the future protection uh, projection in terms of whether or not they will be seen as potential agents of change okay for for this one um the question also becomes uh for the second part that let me start from the second part uh, uh whether or not they will be seen as potential agents of change by whom that that comes uh very clearly for uh it is for example um not ironic actually if you think about the migrant labor in uh, in europe in many of the places that i have uh i had chance to do uh research for the migrants uh as the uh who argues for the migrants it is very often industry and business that chambers of uh business they always come up with this kind of a uh, uh with this kind of a, a plea for uh opening the doors for of course uh keeping certain regulations to create and uh, reproduce and uh, perpetuate the kind of a particular kind of labor uh, labor but they are not looking them as potential agents of change but for if you are looking at the from the um from the uh city leaders and the city authorities uh perspective then you might see them as again uh in a variegated form of who will become a potential for change and this goes very well to the question of migrants is never a homogeneous category and it also goes to the question of uh uh what are the percentage of the migrants who counts who is counted and who counts as uh migrants most probably that when you do that kind of the mig research migration research in so many places people from the rural to the cities might be counted as migrants in if i would be asking in um in austria uh about the migrants none of my uh, colleagues or the students will think about the uh, rural to urban to the cities people as migrants they will not be counted as uh, as migrants and so but it is not only a question of counting them but it is also a question of differentiating among them so uh, one of them would be arguing for this kind of the uh highly skilled ones but also for the uh for the um 
in the cultural artists uh, or sportsmen, if you look at it, they are, uh, they are seen as very important aspect of the teams now in uh, many of the uh, places. And in terms of the visibility through ethnic, I am uh, I'm not always convinced of that the uh, looking through the ethnic lens is the best way to capture the basic identities or the uh, way that the migrants are located in the economies, in the livelihood of or the, in the lives of those cities. No matter, this doesn't mean that uh, these are not, this doesn't mean that ethnicity does not play an important role, but it is a product who is seen as what? And I find it a difficult point in terms of uh, uh, starting from there. Having said that, the visibility question becomes, who becomes visible in what conditions under what kind of an ethnic terms. So if you look at it, so in that sense, I would look at it, I would start as a product, as the end process, not the end process, but it's a product of a, a process. Yes, there are there's, uh, lots of those kind of visibilities, but if you think of, for example, the Europe's history, then the uh, many of the uh, stereotypes that are used in Germany were, for the Turks, for example, were used exactly the same stereotypes were used for Italians, for the Greeks uh, before. But now for the Greeks and then the Italians, people don't think about those ethnic terms. And that the, so this is this kind of the visibility, I would look at it as a kind of a, a process. And it depends that who will see it as a potential agents of uh, change as I said, depending on the sector. Second uh, question was about uh, this uh, question about the devaluing and revaluing and then the hierarchization. Again, this is, for example, this goes very easily to, I mean, not easily, but what I was referring to the kind of the, um, the situation that the Turks have. And now, of course, that the everywhere, Sorry that I'm in Istanbul and there is the Azan. So uh, uh, coming, uh, the um, Afghanis, uh, now they become the kind of the uh, really the demonized and with the toxic max uh, masculinity, uh, they occupy the uh, imaginary. So uh, it just looks at that, who becomes devalued or, uh, or, for example, the Italians or the Greeks, as that they acquired a much valuable position in the uh, urban economies, urban cultural uh, industries. So what I'm saying is that it is a very dynamic process. We could not, uh, and we should be really looking at these this processes in relation to each other. So the example that I was giving from a, a city that where I said that the minorities and the migrants acquired a very important place, of course, not all migrants and not all uh, minorities. Interestingly, it, this was a border city, a Syrian and Turkey's border, and the, uh, the people who become very demonized and very devalued were the rural uh, displaced uh, Kurds in the uh, from the villages to the to that city. But uh, on the other hand, in the cultural, so they were not in the cultural process that a big kind of the in the imaginary of the city or the kind of the uh, prominence in the city imaginaries, they did not have that kind of a space. But on the other hand, there were Syria Christians who were, who had to flee their lives from that place because they were subject to genocide. And this was of course long ago, but they had, uh, they had been, uh, they have been subject to persecutions uh, all through the, uh, you could say the 20th century. 
And starting from the 2000s, they became a very important characteristics, important value for that, uh, that city and sites and that kind of heritage. And even they were demonized because of the, their languages, they acquired a value in, uh, in that city. So what I'm trying to say is that it is, this is a very dynamic processes and it could, uh, we could not um, simply say that the migrants or the refugees were the outcasts in that way. So it is very much hierarchized. So I don't know whether that uh, uh, responds to your uh, question. Uh, yes, uh, ma'am, it does. Thank you. Thank you. The other one was that important, uh, someone was saying that this is actually calling the migrants and refugees and important political actors is an ambitious, uh, is an ambitious uh, statement. And um, I don't think that it's a very ambitious uh, statement. They have always been political uh, actors as much as their uh, economic actors, but they are more now because of also, if you look at it, the way that they challenge the uh, boundaries of membership, boundaries and terms of participation. So what was it that is that if you look at the, um, I mean, the, the more I know, I mean, I know more the European scene that in Europe, if you look at it, the people were, um, the migrants and the refugees could have been there and they become part of the society, but uh, under particular terms. So this has been challenged. And this has been challenged saying that I am different. I want to keep these kinds of certain kinds of identities and certain kinds of relations. And despite that, I claim to be part of the uh, services. I claim to be part of this political body and for that society. So they are challenging the bound. That's why I said that they're challenging the boundaries of the public. That is the, uh, the public is also a very exclusionary uh, category. So in terms of that, when I'm saying that they become political actors and then again, no homogeneous, I mean, there's no homogeneity there and you asked about the percentages. And given that what I had said in terms of that, it's a very tricky issue to identify who is a migrant, who is not a migrant, which is a very conjunctural uh, definition. And, and it's very difficult to even to uh, define on the basis of mobility. There are lots of people who were not mobile and are counted as migrants. And there are lots of people who are very mobile and they have not been counted as uh, migrants. So it is very difficult. It's a tricky uh, definition. You can only understand it, I think, that in terms of who counts and uh, in relation to uh, what and depending on that, the power structures. But for the percentages, actually, the ironically, in all the cities that I had worked, the percentages of migrants were small. Uh, actually, uh, the, in this border city that where I was talking about, of course, there are uh, now that the um, uh, some Syrian uh, refugees, not very strongly, that it's not a city where the Syrian refugees settled very much, but there is lots of, again, still si Syrian child labor in, in that place. But they acquire the presence, and that's what I refer to as a kind of a value, this particular group of migrants and minorities, unproportional to their percentage. And similarly, that we had seen this in relation to a German city that we had worked. So these are not places, metropolitan cities with huge numbers of uh, um, migrant and refugee populations, but interestingly, they became, they acquired a very strong place in the ro local politics and in historical and social justice uh, movements. So um, 
becoming that uh, I think I hope that that answers your question. And then there was the metropolitan cities becoming political subjects um, and then economic political uh, subjects and carry their native identities. Yes, that is, this is, this is not a kind of a, this, uh, when I said that uh, the terms of participation had changed, but I'm not talking about here multiculturalism because uh, that's why I emphasize the commoning project there that you might have very different kinds of identities, affiliations and that, but they became without erosion of that difference, they become actors around the kind of a commoning process, which are very much rights place claims centered. So uh, they, they might carry their that's quote unquote native identities and which is a very, which changes uh, all the time in a way. So we don't have fixed native identities. So, um, and then how do we understand the political participation rights access to uh, resources. So I am not saying that, I mean, this is really within their role in terms of the urban politics. I am talking about the terms of participation and access to rights and access to resources, not simply in terms of in being in a part of the uh, political activism. So uh, they become political subjects in relation to uh, um, how they vision uh, their alliances and how they envision their belonging and participation to that city. I don't know whether that no, I, I think I, I do make a get a sense, but I was just trying to, uh, maybe you've addressed it in your, during your lecture, but when you say city as a method, I, I'm also trying to understand that, you know, how do yes. I explore this political mode, you know, uh, beyond yes. the political activism part? Yeah. Yes, of course, but that is, this is actually, um, and I think that um, when people uh, claim make claims but not in terms of in terms of political activism and in terms of their relations in terms of that's why i said that about the sociabilities recognition of the commonalities between them and in terms of their everyday uh, lives that you can uh, you can see these but you have to uh, we were able to see that but are for that we had to take the entry point of the city as starting from that kind of that, how they are in place, how they are uh, situated in uh, that city. So, and asking, saying that, um, actually recognizing their, the commonalities is a very political act where people are very uh, strictly uh, divided. Or if someone argues um, in one city that th they had the possibility to engage in multicultural politics, and then they refused it. Of course, that is, this is a very specific group. They were the born agains that the Pentecostals, and they divided the city in a very different, uh, on different lines, and established relations with the others, not in the given terms, uh, accepted terms of the uh, uh, politics. So this is being, uh, again, I think this is an act of uh, politics. And so challenging the canons, boundaries of being political. So in that sense, I think, uh, city provides us an important entry point because of the way that it situates the uh, its residents as i said in terms of in a very variable way which could which um, variable way depending on time and space and in terms of the power geometry that city is and uh, uh, embedded in thanks a lot
we have a few more uh, on okay, so discussion can... questions. Okay. So I'll request Muni to please unmute yourself and put your concern right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ritu Panna. See, uh, this is about uh, the question of uh, the kind of uh, apprehension that I wanted to make because I have been uh, working on uh, India's uh, urban spaces, especially in mm -hmm. neoliberal cities. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the kind of the stock of migrants that come to India's urban spaces, as you have said that, that you know some of them are reduced to a labor but they are looking for better visibility and incorporation into the political, cultural landscape of the city. But if you look at the, uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, the supply side uh, from India's rural hinterlands, they, uh, they wanted to remain anonymous and remain very, uh, you know, kind of marginal, not even planning to get into the political landscape or getting into the social sphere partially because of their own vulnerabilities in their own uh, hinterlands, probably because of uh, their own caste operation and marginalization that they have come. So it uh, actually makes uh, you know, the, the kind of epistemological and methodological issues that you have uh, you know, posed. As somewhere uh, you also have mentioned that this kind of internal migrants do not really constitute in that the methodological space. But uh, you know, uh, you know. Recently, I went through uh, one of the uh, books by this uh, Ranabir Samantar. He was basically talking about this uh, migrants uh, and the neoliberal city, where he is trying to make a point that the cities in India do not want them to be accepted. So, at the supply side, they do not want to be recognized as a kind of fully. Uh, you know, kind of recognized uh, agents or uh, people in the city. So agency does not come, you know, even uh, they feel that their economic recognition itself is a big thing to happen. So how do we address these methodological complexities that, uh, you know, many of the uh, migrants that constitute India's neoliberal uh, city? Okay. I mean, in terms of that, what you're bringing up is that um, I am not sure how that you could, I mean, Ranabir could correct me in, in terms of what uh, he was arguing for that, but uh, it's very difficult to uh, imagine uh, groups of, it. first of all, I don't make that distinction between internal migrants and international migrants. I think we should really addressing the uh, issue uh, within a common uh, theoretical frame. Uh, otherwise, it is really very much looking like uh, looking like a state. Uh, so seeing like a state. So I don't think that we should do that. We should be putting them into the same uh, framework. But also, I find it always very difficult to understand when people say that they don't even want to be recognized. They don't want to uh, actually anchor themselves there. No matter what we, what we want or not, we anchor, they anchor themselves like everyone else in terms of their neighborhoods, in terms of their uh, uh, livelihoods, you, there is no way to reduce. And actually this is the difficulty that the people for the, for the migrant labor asking for it, they want, to re, they want them to remain as only as labor and only as in terms of economic value. And this has never, uh, 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 this has not happened anywhere, I think. So when you say that they do not, uh, because of their marginalizations from their background and that sometimes cities provide very, um, um, very important opportunities to uh, to go beyond those kind of marginalizations. If you, you are talking about, you said that you mentioned about that the caste uh, caste issues, but for example, I could 
uh, and also, for example, for that international uh, migration also works very well. The, if you look at it the, um, from Bulgaria, it is, it is in many places, the ones who went for um, cross-border migration, that the representatives of the groups of people who were marginalized in their quote unquote native towns and then excluded are always higher. And actually that had opened particular kind of opportunities that I could say, uh, but it again depends where you land, how you are incorporated and how you become part of that urban uh, dynamics, which is very much dependent on the historical conjuncture. For example, in um, in Turkey, the uh, Alevis actually the migration provided a very important opportunity for the people to uh, go beyond that kind of the marginalization that they were subject. Cross border migration actually enabled them to be recognized as a religious minority, for example, in, in Europe. So uh, they might be people, um, uh, migrants usually, uh, of course, this temporariness ideology and with the conditions trying to uh, reproduce is very uh, dominant. But I don't think that as researchers, we should let ourselves to be carried uh, away from the people's own narratives about themselves, thinking that these our narratives about ourselves are also constructed and a product of a particular kind of a, a relationship. This is Chandra. We have one more question from Vishwaji. So I guess this would be the last one. Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for, a, for an excellent lecture. Uh, my question is very specific to uh, political movement that you have uh, been talking about. Uh, that, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, are active participants in creating common good. Uh, but because of their vulnerabilities or their disempowered position, uh, they may not always be actively participating in that uh, form of politics that you're talking about. So what role does the passive and everyday form of resistance play in changing politics in their favor. Thank you very much for pointing out that because I was talking about in terms of the really with the commoning and then the contentious politics, but oh, this does not exclude actually this kind of everyday form of resistance and uh, their role in changing uh, politics in the sense of the term of, uh, again, I will say that the terms of participation, the terms of being part of that society, that even sometimes refusing the kind of the, um, to speak that particular kind of the language or uh, refusing to become part of the uh, canonized lives and tra trajectories is a very important aspect of uh, acquiring, raising voice and true uh, resistance. I mean, um, and we know that uh, actually the uh, Indonesian's work on the um, acts of citizenship is very, I think, very suitable for that. The moment that you resist to accept the terms and uh, boundaries of uh, being part of that uh, society in their in your everyday life. Uh, the classical example is that, of course, that if you parks that sitting in the uh, in the bus where she, she was not allowed to sit and refusing to stand up. These are, I think, very important, and these are the kinds of the resistance which we could uh, say that they in, uh, inflict a crack in the order of things. And so it doesn't have to be uh, militant political uh, mobilizations or loud mo uh, mobilizations, but these kinds of acts actually shake and uh, inflict a kind of create cracks where it is very difficult to, or 
the moment that you start to, you try to uh, recover that crack, actually it continues opening more cracks. So in that sense, I think they are, they are very important. Thank you, Professor Chara, for responding to the queries and concerns of the participants. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many more participants would like to interact with you, so I request them to put all their concerns with us and we will mail them to you or we can have another round of discussion sometime later, probably. Uh, so uh, with this, we come to the end of today's discussion on uh, city as a method. Uh, it has been an engaging session on how to look on uh, city as a method in the migration studies. Uh, we will have our next session on the next uh, coming Saturday on the 7th of August on feminist methods in migration research and the questions of ethics uh, by Professor Paula Banerjee. Uh, thank you so much everyone for having a precious time with us for a wonderful discussion and participation in this program on reading refugees, reading migration. Uh, that has been conducted by CRG in collaboration with the funds of uh, IWM and uh, the collaborative participation by RLS and IWM. So thank you so much. We come to the end of this discussion now. So. Um, thank you very much. I, I thank you for enabling uh, for uh, this, for allowing me to express my voice, but also for your Excellent questions. I might have not responded all of them, but uh, I'm always available and I would love to continue the conversation uh, with you. I keep learning from the CRG a lot and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>